Hey, we, we started a series with a very sophisticated title last week. Uh, it's called The Jesus Stuff. And we're talking about who Jesus is. And we're talking about walking in the way of Jesus. And uh, just acknowledging that every, every once in a while, we, we need to take the time to pause and to recalibrate and realign ourselves with the way of Jesus. Because oftentimes we can get distracted or we can just kind of drift a little bit. And uh, what, what a blessing it is to have God's word to continue continue to just call us back to uh, our, our master, our Messiah, and to follow him. And Luke chapter 6, verse 40, uh, sort of grounded us as we began. Luke 6, verse 40 says, students are not greater than their teacher, but the student who is fully trained will become like the teacher. So in this series, what we're saying is, teacher, teach. Jesus, the teacher, would you teach? Would you be our rabbi? Would you teach us in, in the ways, of the places that were you focused? And uh, we began this series talking about the mercy of Jesus, noticing that so much of what he did was motivated by compassion and mercy. Yet, at the same time, realizing that there's something about compassion and mercy that causes us to think that, uh, well, that's, that's kind of the stuff of people who don't have, you know, the guts to maybe perhaps in our current cultural moment stand up and, uh, and just speak out on stuff. And uh, we, we, we see our, 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 our nation, our world, in which there's much of which we would say that is wrong with it, that we, we see compassion perhaps as not as being an effective tool in addressing that. And I would say that there are people from the past who would have agreed with that sort of conclusion, who would say compassion is sort of, a, it's, for the, it's for the people who are kind of the wamby-pamby people, the people who don't have a spine, you know, the, the, those kind of folks. And uh, it's great that happens, we're not against it, but there, that's been a feeling that's been around a very long time. Roman philosopher named Seneca actually said that compassion is the vice of the feeble soil, soul, the feeble soul. Uh, that, that, that's for the weak person. Uh, the famed German philosopher, Friedrich Nietzsche, uh, was, was, was quoted as saying, it would be a noble virtue to overcome the strength and health-injuring notion of sympathy. Nietzsche is the, the famed philosopher who said God is dead, and he actually, uh, he actually thought, if you want suffering to decrease in our world, don't show compassion, because to, to be compassionate is to suffer with someone. So that actually doubles the suffering in the world. And he, he actually proposed that it, it was okay to be cruel. And there was this guy named Adolf Hitler that was inspired by what Nietzsche wrote. Um, and you can pick up some of Nietzsche's thinking in his book, Mein Kampf. And, um, and this idea that compassion, that, that's just, I mean, we need people to do something courageous. And, and again, again, in our current cultural moment, we, we have calls to stand up. And many people are, are motivated by courage or perhaps motivated by anger, or motivated by a whole host of things. And yet we see Jesus setting the pathway for us, and he's motivated and moved with compassion. And again, with so much that is wrong in our world, it just kind of feels counterintuitive, but let's remind ourselves of the words of Paul as he wrote to a church in Corinth. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, uh, Paul would write uh, these words, I'll put them up here on, on the screen. Uh, he says, we are human, but we don't wage war as humans do. We use God's mighty weapons, not worldly weapons to knock down the strongholds of human reasoning and to destroy false arguments. Here's what I think one of the things Jesus is showing us. That compassion is one of the kingdom of heaven's mighty weapons. See it as a laser-guided missile that will destroy and blow up the, the, the schemes and the strategies of the evil one. That actually compassion and mercy could accomplish the very things that we would wish to see done in our world. And this is exactly the way of Jesus. This is what Jesus did. And we talked about this this last week, but this week what I want to talk to you, I want to talk to you about the miracles of Jesus. Uh, this series, the Jesus stuff, we're talking about the, the mercy of Jesus, the miracles of Jesus, and the message of Jesus. We want to recalibrate our, ourselves to the Jesus stuff. Now, there's a guy that, that you may know his name. His name is John Wimber. Wimber actually began the Vineyard Movement, which would become a denomination, the Vineyard Denomination. Wimber, before he met Jesus, was a, was a musician. He actually had a pretty good gig going on on the Las Vegas strip. He had his gig there for five years on the Las Vegas strip, and then he hit it big. Wimber signed with the Righteous Brothers, 
and, as, as an instrumentalist. And uh, things were going well, and his life w- was seeming to, 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 all these dreams are being fulfilled. But then he encountered Jesus. He was apprehended by Jesus. And before he met Jesus, Wimber described himself as a beer-guzzling, chain-smoking, drug-abusing pop musician. And, and he, he left that all behind when he encountered Jesus. He joined a Bible study uh, led by some Quakers, the, the Friends Church, and he was voraciously consuming the Word of God. He was particularly drawn to the Gospels. He was so moved by the person of Jesus. He's sitting in church one day and listening to the pastor preach as he's been studying God's word and he's, he's disturbed inside. He, he's, he's confused inside and when the church service is over and the pastor's at the back of the sanctuary, he walks up to the pastor and asks this question. When are we gonna do the stuff? When, when do we get to do the stuff? And the pastor is confused. Like, wh- what are you talking about, John? And what do you mean, the stuff? Stuff, and Wimber would respond to him and say, the stuff, you know, the stuff that Jesus did where he, he healed the sick and he, he restored eyesight to the blind and he fed the 5,000 and he cast out demons, raised people from the dead. When do we get to do the stuff? And the pastor sort of smiled and said, to, well, John, here, here's what you need to know. In this church, we believe that Jesus did the stuff. We just today don't do that stuff. We preach that stuff, but we believe that Jesus did the stuff. And in Wimber-like fashion, he quickly responds to the pastor and says, you gotta be kidding me, you mean I, I, left, I left, I gave up drugs for this? And Wimber would lead the church and he would later say that, you know, when I was serving in the kingdom of darkness unknowingly, when I was doing all the deeds of darkness and I was following the ways of the devil, the devil, Satan, he let me do his stuff anytime I wanted to. Why wouldn't Jesus, in a world that is throbbing with pain, why wouldn't Jesus want us to do his stuff? And I think Wimber's got a point, especially when you listen to the words of Jesus. John chapter 14, these are Jesus' words. He says, very truly I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing. And they will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father. And I will do whatever you ask in my name so the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask for anything in my name and I will do it. It seems pretty clear, but what's, what's interesting and actually quite fascinating is that when you, when you see this, what you hear is a lot of people going to all kinds of, of work to tell us that, look, I know that's what the Gospel of John says, but that's not exactly what Jesus meant. Because I read this commentary, and this commentator says that's not, that's not actually what Jesus meant. He was talking about something else where that was then and this is now, and that all happened so they could set the, the church up, and then now we don't need those things. And it just, I find it fascinating the, the effort that people will go to say that that kind of stuff just doesn't happen anymore. Or some who will say, well, you know, that kind of stuff did happen, but it just wasn't central to the ministry of Jesus. Really? I I just made a list of uh, a few of the the miracles of Jesus. It's not all the miracles of Jesus, but can I read them to you? Just so you can be reminded of the kind of stuff Jesus went about and did. Jesus turns water into wine at a wedding in Cana. Jesus heals an official son in Capernaum. Jesus drives out an evil spirit in a man in Capernaum. He heals Peter's mother-in-law who's sick with a fever. Jesus heals many sick and oppressed one evening. There's a miraculous catch of fish on the lake of of Gennesaret. Jesus cleanses a man with leprosy. Jesus heals a centurion's paralyzed servant in Capernaum. Jesus heals a paralytic who is let down from a roof. Jesus heals a withered hand on the Sabbath. Jesus raises a woman's son from the dead in Nain. Jesus calms a storm on the sea. Jesus casts demons into a herd of pigs. Jesus heals a woman in the crowd with an issue of blood. Jesus raises Jairus' daughter back to life. Jesus heals two blind men. Jesus heals a man who is unable to speak. Jesus heals an invalid at the pool of Bethesda. 
Jesus then feeds 5,000 men plus women and children and Jesus walks on water. Jesus heals many sick in Gennesaret as they touch his garment. Jesus heals a Gentile woman's demon-possessed daughter. Jesus heals a deaf and mute man. Jesus feeds 4,000 men plus women and children. Jesus heals a blind man at Bethesda. Jesus heals a man by spitting into his eyes. Interesting. Jesus heals a boy with an unclean spirit. Jesus causes a miraculous tax to appear in a fish's mouth. Jesus heals a blind, mute demoniac. Jesus heals a woman who has a bent back for 18 years. Jesus heals a man with dropsy on the Sabbath. Jesus cleanses 10 lepers. He raises Lazarus from the dead in Bethany. He restores the sight to Bartimaeus in Jericho. He withers with his voice the fig tree on the road from Bethany. Jesus heals Malchus's ear while he is being arrested. And the second miraculous catch of fish takes place on the Sea of Galilee. And let's not forget Jesus is resurrected from the dead. It doesn't feel like the miracles of Jesus are on the periphery of what he was about. It actually feels like it's very central to what Jesus was about. And yet some will say that, hold on a second, Steve, that the miracles are there to affirm and confirm his deity. Agreed. 22% of the time when Jesus does a miracle is to affirm his deity, that he is the divine son of God. Yet 25% of the time, Jesus is doing a miracle to set someone free from the bondage of darkness and to cast out a demon and to see someone walk in that freedom. And over 50% of the time, get this, you can't miss this, over 50% of the time, as Jesus is going village to village, preaching the good news of the message of the kingdom of heaven, which we'll talk about next week, he sees people in their circumstances and what he sees moves him. He gets all twisted up inside and he, he then leans over and he heals and he, and, he, and he prays and he touches and over 50% of the miracles of, of Jesus are simply mercy moments where he encounters a world that's throbbing in pain and he heals and he alleviates and he sets people free. Friends, this is our Jesus and this is the stuff that he's about. And yet there is this, this pull to embrace a Christianity that's devoid of the supernatural. And C.S. Lewis, I think, captures the danger of that. Lewis would say, the mind which asks for a non-miraculous Christianity is a mind in a process or in process of relapsing from Christianity into mere religion. It's a process of moving from a dynamic, uh, life-giving, like truly God is in this place kind of experience to a form and a structure and an external sort of reality that doesn't match the inner reality of who we are called to be. And this is the kind of stuff that Jesus gave his ministry to. He gave his life to showing compassion and mercy and yes, doing the miraculous. Another Wimberism. John Wimber would say that faith is spelled R-I-S-K. And if God doesn't show up, you can look D-U-M-B. Faith is spelled, spelled R-I-S-K, and if God doesn't show up, you can look D-U-M-B. I'm a young pastor, pastoring a church up in Kelso, Washington. Small church, and it's processing, how, how do we bring... Jesus, our healer, into what we do as a regular part of our gatherings. And as I was talking with the elders, we decided that we would pray for the sick on communion Sundays. And so when we had communion, there would be a, a, a part of the, the sanctuary people would go to and they could, they could be prayed for healing. There was a friend of mine, his name was Jonathan, he was in the church and he, he was confined to a wheelchair. And I remember having a conversation with him and he was saying, you know, I, I would love to be healed. I'd love to be able to get out of this chair. And so I said to him, do, do you, you want to come forward and we have our prayer time at church and be anointed with oil and, and ask Jesus to heal you? And he said, yeah, that's what I, what I want. I said, well, you, you pray about it, you think about it, and if you do, just come on up and uh, we're going to pray for you. And um, it was communion Sunday and he was there and I walked over to him and I prayed over him and, um, and then when we got done praying, I, I said to him, do you, do you want me to pull you out of your chair? Because that's what Jesus did, right? He just, he like, he like 
Rise up and walk. Take, pick up your mat and walk. Do you want me to pull you out of chair? And he looked at me and said, yep, I do. Did I tell you that faith is spelled R-I-S-K? And that when God doesn't show up, you can look D-U-M-B? I grabbed Jonathan and I pulled him up. And nothing happened. And then I did that in front of a whole bunch of people who didn't know the conversation we were having. And I put him back in his chair and he looked at me and smiled and I looked at him and smiled and like, he still loves Jesus. But we felt like this is the kind of stuff Jesus does. And yet you and I also realize that there are moments in our lives where we've, we've been seeking Jesus to move in these ways and maybe that kind of moment is one of, one of your experiences and there's something about that you're like, I don't want to look D-U-M-B again. And we distance ourselves from the very things that Jesus has actually called us into. Now, why is that? I, I think there's some, some reasons why. Let me just highlight a few of them. Some of us are frank, we're just disappointed with God. We're disappointed with God. You, you, you may be sitting here going, or you're watching in a house church, watching online, and you're listening maybe on the podcast, and you're thinking, yeah, yeah I used to believe that. I, I, used to, I used to be all in on that, and I prayed, and I prayed, and I prayed, and nothing ever happened. In fact, there was someone who I deeply loved, and I prayed about their circumstances, and, and they died, or they were still in suffering. They were still in pain. They still, still had that, that chronic disease, and nothing happened. And, you know, I, I, I've been down that road, and you're not taking me down that road again. And disappointment has sort of quenched your thirst and your hunger to see God intervene in our world in this way again. And if you're feeling that way, let me just encourage you and simply say that, you know, you're not the only one who's ever felt that way. In fact, the scriptures talk about people having their own disappointment in God when he doesn't come through. Think for a moment about John the Baptist. John the Baptist was this, this guy, well, even when his mom, Elizabeth, was pregnant with him and Mary walks into the room and Mary is pregnant with Jesus, that John the Baptist, he jumps in his mother's womb. I mean, so much that Elizabeth, she, she feels it. And it's as if John, the baby, understands who, whose presence he's in. He knows that the Messiah is there. In fact, the father tells him that you'll know who the Messiah is because when you baptize and the dove comes on this person, then you'll know that person is the Messiah. And John sees this, sees it. He has a sign. He knows that Jesus is the Messiah. He's so convinced that he's pointing him out to his own disciples some of his own disciples would go and they would be disciples of Jesus behold the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world he's going public with this declaration he knows that Jesus is the Messiah he's leading an incredible revival in the middle of nowhere in a desert this man is used by God he's he knows what it's like to see God on the move he's preaching boldly he's calling out sin in fact it lands him in a prison cell he, he confronts Herod, and he's in a prison cell, and friends, I have to believe that he's praying and asking God for deliverance, and it's not happening. He's asking for freedom from this prison cell, and he's not being set free, and I think this disappointment of being stuck in a prison cell actually leads him to a place of disappointment, so much so that he will send messengers to Jesus, that's his way of text messaging, he'll send messengers to Jesus to ask a question. Are you the one? Or should we expect someone else? Wait a minute here, John. You're the guy who's jumping in your mom's womb. You're the guy who saw the sign of the dove coming down from heaven. You're the one who's declaring, behold, the Lamb of God takes away the sin of the world. Yeah, but God's disappointed him. So he sends the message, are, are you the one? Luke records the response of Jesus when he gets the message. He says, go and tell John what you have seen and heard. The blind are recovering their sight. Cripples are walking again. Lepers being healed. The deaf hearing. Dead men are being brought back, brought to life again. And the good news is being given to those in need. And happy is the one who never loses faith in me. Friends, has disappointment led you to the place where your faith in Jesus intervening in your life has subsided to the point where maybe it's even gone so much as to the point of it's an offense. God, I, I thought you were good. 
don't receive condemnation or shame. Understand that there are some amazing people that the scriptures testify about who felt the very same way. But friends, happy is the one, happy is the one who doesn't lose faith in Jesus even when your miracle doesn't happen. I think that's one reason why people have given up on the Jesus stuff is because we're disappointed. Here's the second one. I think we struggle with cynicism and a sophistication bias. I think we struggle with cynicism and a sophistication bias. Here's what I mean. Yeah, I saw that YouTube video and I saw those wackos doing what they do. Yeah, I saw that person pushing that person over and yeah, I, I, I know they pulled somebody out of a wheelchair but everyone knows that was staged to make it look like this, there's healing was going on and we heard some of the stories and the, you know, the investigations were done. It was all fake and there's just something about us. It's like, we're smarter with that and you know, I used to believe that but I'm pretty cynical anytime it happens. We hear about a miracle and there's something in us that instantly goes, really, did, did it really happen? Is that how it really went down? And so our, our, our unbelief sort of kicks in and, or our sophistication bias where, you know what, that can't be God. God wouldn't move in that way. And our, our comfort zone becomes our discernment uh, level. Like truly God wouldn't do that, that that way. There was a massive revival that took place in the New Hebrides. Uh, it, it was in the 1950s and the spirit of God was coming on the church and coming on the cities, people who never stepped in church, so much so that people were lying on the ground in town groaning under the weight of their own guilt and shame because of their sin. They, they brought in this man, his name was Duncan Campbell, and Campbell helped steward that, re, that revival. It was going on before he even showed up, but he's stewarding and he's preaching, and God is doing amazing things in these church services. But there were churches that were resistant, and they, they couldn't really believe that this was truly God. Do you know what their one issue with Campbell was? He preached in brown shoes. Can you imagine a preacher ever preaching in brown shoes? That just sounds, this is ridiculous. It's this sophistication bias. God wouldn't work that way. God wouldn't do that. This is what it looks like, and there's something in us that rejects. I mean, Jesus is spitting in people's eyes. He's making mud. It, it's just odd. Yet, a blind man re- gets his sight restored. John Wesley, on this topic, of our sophistication bias, says the grand reason why the miraculous were so soon withdrawn was not only that faith and holiness were well nigh lost, but that dry, formal, orthodox men began to ridicule them then whatever gifts they had not themselves and to decry them all as either madness or imposture. You're crazy. You're not doing it right. And so our disappointment And our cynicism, our unbelief, and our sophistication bias keep us from doing the Jesus stuff. Last one I'll I'll hit real real quickly. We have disappointment. We've got the sophistication bias and cynicism. Some are, we're just too self-sufficient. The spirit of the church of Laodicea is upon us. We've got everything we need. we're, We're fine. You know, we, 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 we've got resources to, to deal with certain things. We, we, we can take care of that problem this way. We just put these programs in or throw money this way or we're, we're fine. We, we've got God's word and, and the miracles were needed. Yeah, yeah, they were needed. It was important. But when we got God's word, now we have his word. and His word does miraculous things. It's living and active. And man, I, I love God's word. I love coming under God's word. It's such a safe place. I, I love to digest what, just the wisdom of God's word and love to see it speak to me. But friends, can we remind ourselves that the word of God actually points to a person and his name is Jesus? Yet sometimes our self-sufficiency keeps us from going to our our Jesus who's moved with compassion and intervenes and loves, he loves to heal the deep throbbing wounds of our world. I'm gonna invite Linda to come join me up here on the platform. Linda is uh, our executive pastor here at Sam Alliance. And um, Linda has a story of encountering this Jesus that we're talking about. 
Because Linda, you found yourself in a place of pain not too long ago, and Jesus did something amazing. So talk to us about that. Yeah, I had been experiencing some significant back pain. Um, I don't know what I had injured. I don't actually know um, where it came from, but was uh, not coping well, shall we say. We had um, a lunch meeting, in fact, and you watched me grimace as I tried to step up a curb to, to get out of the parking lot and to gingerly lower myself down into a chair. If you've had back pain, you know you get creative in trying to figure out ways. How am I going to roll myself out of bed? How am I going to position myself in and out of chairs? Um, it was just annoying and um, it hurt, right? So. We were in PMT, our pastoral management team, so our executive leadership team, and we had talked through, um, hey, I'll give you my chiropractor's name, or you should try this massage tool, or are you heating, or are you cooling, icing, all of these things. And Rob Basham said, we need to pray. And uh, I thought that was a great idea, and I think my attitude going into that was one of, uh, certainly, Jesus could heal me, uh, but would he? Uh, so I entered with a hope, but certainly not a sense of expectation. As the group prayed over me, I got really hot. Uh, I was shaking my shirt. I looked around, opened my eyes as everyone was praying. No one else appeared to be having hot flashes. The room was not suddenly, you know, 25 degrees hotter. And as I stopped long enough to really pay attention, there was an intense heat in my back. And I must have had a look on my face when we stopped praying because you just looked at me and said, what? What's going on? And I wasn't quite sure what to think immediately. I kind of twisted in my seat. I stood up pain-free. I sat down pain-free. I stood up. I sat down. I twisted. We actually walked around the block. And the pain was gone instantaneously, just gone. Uh, it was amazing. And Laura Scherer looked at me and she said, do you feel loved? And I answered yes in the moment, but I didn't understand the full magnitude. I knew, I, I knew Jesus had healed me and I knew he had seen me in my pain. But just days later, we loaded up our family. We delivered our daughter to her freshman year in college. And we spent a couple days at Disneyland on a family vacation. And there were so many instances in those following days where I was caught and struck by the, I am enjoying this because I'm pain free. I'm participating in carrying boxes up to my daughter's third floor dorm room. I'm fully present as a mother because I'm pain free. And so in those moments, I experienced being seen and being loved like I never could have imagined. Yeah, it's pretty powerful. It was a pretty powerful moment. And I remember when you stood up, some of us heard a pop in your back. And uh, we, we were all stunned in, in the moment. Um, and uh, thank you for sharing your story. And I've actually asked Linda, because she's experienced this like three weeks ago, I think, that this took place. I've asked Linda to, to, to pray for those of us in the room who need healing. Uh, this is something we do. It's one of our regular practices. And we, had a, we, we had a healing testimony. We invite people to stand, whether it's a physical need they have or it's a relational or emotional need, just to stand and just, just ask Jesus of Nazareth, the same Jesus that we read about in the scriptures, to continue to do what he does so well. So if that is you in a house church or maybe you're on a walk uh, or, or in the room, I want to invite you to stand right now if that is you. If you, you want Jesus to heal you, this is your way of just saying... I, this is my act of faith. This is the equivalent of me saying, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And Linda, would you pray healing over those who are standing here in the room and standing in house churches? Our Jesus who loves us and sees us, thank you for being the all-compassionate, all-loving, all-encompassing God. Thank you for seeing us in our need. God, you see the people in this room and you know their deepest needs, their pains, their hurts, their illnesses, their aches. And so God, there are tumors in this room 
on, on organs, on bones. I declare your healing power on tumors in this room. Lord, there are stomach and digestive issues, people who have been dealing with intolerances or allergies or whatever it is that has decreased their enjoyment of, of food and things that you've given us as gifts. God, I declare healing. Jesus, would you bring your power? Do it, Lord. In the name of the powerful Lord Jesus Christ, heal those in pain, heal the shoulders, heal the backs, heal the ankles. Lord, you can turn our mourning into dancing. Would there be someone in this room, literal dancing, because you have healed them today. God, we declare your healing power in the name of the almighty Son, Jesus Christ. In his matchless name we pray. Amen. 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 Thanks, Linda. And you can be seated. Thanks for trusting us and allowing us to pray over you. And of course, if you have a story of healing, we'd love to hear about it because those stories cause faith to rise. That's indeed what the stories of the Gospels do for us. Cause faith to rise that our Christ is alive and he's still doing the work of healing. Hey, a couple things we're gonna wrap up. Here's just a, a couple ways that we could walk in, in, in this. Um, first one is this, is to simply identify the place in your life where you, you would love to see God move. It's asking Jesus for your miracle. What is it? What's, what's the miracle that you're asking Jesus for? And perhaps in the next 30 days, you could just concentrate and be praying, Lord, I, I, I'm crying out to you. I'm like the persistent widow. I'm gonna just keep bugging you for 30 days. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna ask you to heal. And, um, and even as you're doing that, what you're doing is you're, you're listening because here's the tension. Sometimes, sometimes Jesus, I mean, Jesus can do anything, but he doesn't do everything, right? And why does he do everything? I, I don't know. But I just think I, he's pretty smart. So I think he knows what he's doing. But we need to be listeners as we're asking Jesus to move on our behalf. Paul, the apostle, if anyone deserved a miracle for their performance, it would be him. That's not how miracles happen. Paul was asking for a miracle, and as he's listening, this is what uh, the Holy Spirit says to Paul in 2 Corinthians. I was given a thorn in my flesh. Three different times I begged the Lord to take it away. Each time he said, my grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. Friends, sometimes God says, actually what the best thing for you is for me not to move in that way because weakness is actually gonna do something in the kingdom that is going to be a bit counterintuitive. So we ask in faith, knowing that if God heals, we say praise God, and we ask in faith, if he says no, we still say praise God because we trust him because he's trustworthy and he's sovereign. But don't let that keep you from asking. The second thing I would say is, is this, start doing the stuff. Start doing, the, the, take Jesus' word and start doing the stuff. When you see someone who's sick, offer to pray for them. Ask them, get their permission. Uh, pray for them. Uh, if you find yourself in a situation uh, that you think, oh, I feel that nudge, follow the nudge. And, 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 and pray and ask Jesus to heal, ask God to intervene, ask God to supply, ask God to provide. And my guess is that the more you're doing that, the more chance you're gonna have an encounter with seeing God at work in the moment, like those of us did in the room with Linda. It was like, oh my goodness. We, we got to be there, we got to experience it, the joy that was on her face. You'll have those same experiences. My wife Trina was in the Middle East with some other women from Salem Alliance some years ago. They're going to go do a, a, a retreat and as they were preparing to, to do the retreat, they're having all kinds of appointments. And they were going around and, um, and visiting people and they were in downtown Amman, Jordan. They were gonna head to a church to, to hold an event and um, they got in their car and as they put the, the key in the car, the car wouldn't start. And there was a bit of a, a, a rise in anxiety in the car because they had to go. They were speaking and they were expected and uh, it seemed like the battery is dead or the starter wasn't working. And so uh, they began to think, okay, who's the mechanic we call? We don't know anyone in the city. How are we gonna, how are we gonna solve this? And, and, and this, this kind of this frenetic moment gave birth to a moment where Trina actually said, well, what if we pray? Did I tell you that faith is spelled R-I-S-K 
And if God doesn't show up, you, look, you might look D-U-M-B. Everyone in the car believes in prayer, but that moment's like, uh, we, we know the issue. It's, it's a dead battery. Maybe a starter, uh, okay, let's pray. And as Trina is praying a short prayer of Jesus, heal this car, it, she's thinking in herself, God, you better show up. I'm going to look like an idiot here. <laughs> she finishes her prayer, nothing fancy in the prayer. Key goes into ignition. Everyone looks at each other. They turn the key. Car starts. Apparently, God heals cars, too. <laughs> now, I'm not saying that, that you, know, you, you, you should not take your car to the mechanic, but what I am saying is, friends, Jesus is incredibly kind. And I think it's time for the church, the big C church, to start doing the Jesus stuff, motivated with compassion. And to ask Jesus to do what only Jesus can do. And allow God to be the God of our first resort. Go to him first. And as we do, I think we just may be amazed at how good our God is. Let's pray together. So Lord, Thank you for even the tide levels of hope that have been rising in this room today. There are some folks who have just, frankly, they've given up on praying about something because it just seemed like you weren't interested or you weren't listening or whatever. And I just ask and pray, Lord, that, that, that hope and that faith would continue to rise. I pray that we'd be a community that can rejoice with those who are rejoicing and we can mourn with those who are mourning because there are people in this room who are in pain and you haven't healed. Lord, this is the family, this is, this is the church. And we don't wanna just live in a place of, of victory and pretend like everything's going well, and yet we don't wanna live in a land of unbelief either and just think that, well, that this stuff, this doesn't happen anymore. Would you give us the wisdom and would you allow us to be a faith-filled people who take those spirit-filled risks? Promptings by you knowing that you are Jesus, you are a God who is so, so kind, so tenderhearted, and who hears every prayer. Thank you for being our good God. We pray this in your name. Amen.